R.L. Stein's Stuff of Nightmares, Resident Evil 9 Rumor Leaks, and the Indiana Jones Supernatural Horror Movie That Almost Was, all on this Monday edition of Spill the Guts. Like it's spooky. <laughs> Clint, and when I'm not co-hosting the I Like a Spooky Horror podcast, I'm here as your tri-weekly random genre news blitz roundup voice every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Let's get into some of that randomness now, because today is Monday, June 26th, and this just in. R.L. Stein is back with more nightmares for Boom Studios. Last September, Boom released Stein's four-issue limited comic series, Stuff of Nightmares, The Monster Makers, presenting a twist on the classic tale of a mad scientist. Stuff of Nightmares Red Murder is hitting comic shops this September, and this time Stein is taking us to a horror convention. The official synopsis reads, Comic creator Alex Ozaka has been out of the spotlight for decades, and he'll wish he'd remained in obscurity soon enough. A real axe murderer, cosplaying as a titular hatchet-wielding killer in his early 2000s smash hit series Red Murder, starts chopping down equally real victims at a horror convention. Artist Adam Gorm from The Blue Flame joined Stein for this new self-contained story. Stein, of course, rose to spooky fame with his best-selling Goosebumps children's books, but we also know and love him for his Fear Street series, which was revived by Netflix for a Chainsaw Award-winning trilogy. Stein recently dove into the world of graphic horror for adults, which was a dream come true for the author. Stuff of Nightmares Red Murder issue number one features a main cover by Francesco Frank Villa from Night of the Ghoul, with variants by Adam Gorm of The Blue Flame, Miguel Mercado from Go Go Power Rangers, Al Kaplan from Maw, Becca Carey from Radiant Black, and Reiko Murakami from Basketful of Heads. Stuff of Nightmares is something R.L. Stein and I love to come back to, said editor Sophie Phillips Roberts. It's such a vast sandbox to tell stories in, and with Red Murder, we found the perfect collaborator in Adam. Stuff of Nightmares Red Murder issue number one will be available in comic shops September 27th of this year. It is available for pre-order at your local comic shop, and digital copies can be purchased from content providers including Comixology, iBooks, Google Play, and Kindle. Resident Evil. Comicbook.com reports that a new rumor about Resident Evil 9 is circulating, but is it true? The rumor comes the way of a Twitter user by the name of Chris Marks, who has been attracting some attention for some posts that seemingly relayed certain information before it was officially revealed. And this is true, however, a lot of this leaked information can also be chalked up to reasonable speculation. In other words, many of the bets made so far have been very safe ones. This is all to say, take everything here with a grain of salt. According to the Twitter user, the next mainline installment is set to release sometime in the back half of 2024, will be revealed this year, will star Chris Renfield, and will bring back a variety of the classic Resident Evil characters. Resident Evil 9 will primarily revolve around the character of Chris Renfield, with the potential inclusion of other classic characters in the narrative. However, it is my belief that the story arc involving Ethan Winters has concluded, or at least temporarily reached its conclusion, reads the new rumor. The rumor continues classic characters such as Claire, Jill, Leon, and Chris, the protagonist, will return in the upcoming Resident Evil game. Players will also have the chance to play as other characters in certain missions. Although the game is expected to focus less on horror and more on action, it will still be a horror game. The camera mode is yet to be confirmed, but there is still a possibility that players may have the option to choose between third-person and first-person perspectives. I expect it to release later in 2024, and Capcom should start talking later this year. Again, a good portion of this, if not all of it, is fairly predictable. If you were going to take a shot in the dark and make a few bets about Resident Evil 9, these are the bets you'd make. In fact, if you played Resident Evil Village, spoilers ahead, then you will know that it's hinted Chris Renfield will be the next protagonist. 
All right, if you have listened to Spill the Guts before, then you know that the algorithm dictates that it is time to pause for station identification and hear from our podcast network, the PFPN. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. And it's time for the last story of the day. Were you aware of the supernatural Indiana Jones movie that was sort of almost made? Well, BloodyDisgusting.com reports, Considering the face-melting, heart-ripping, accelerated aging, and giant man-eating ants, the Indiana Jones franchise has always flirted with horror. Some of his adventures dabbled a little more than others, and there's a reason that Temple of the Doom outraged the PG-13 rating into existence. With the exception of spin-off novels and comics in which the good doctor has fought vampires, discovered dinosaurs, defeated an army of guerrilla slaves, and survived a place literally named Horror Island, Indiana Jones hasn't tackled an out-and-out horror story on the big screen. That's not to say he didn't come close. In the summer of 1977, on a beach somewhere in Hawaii, two directors were hiding from the world. Steven Spielberg had barely survived the grueling production of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and George Lucas didn't want to know how badly his sci-fi gamble Star Wars was bombing. They were musing about other projects when Lucas brought up an idea he had been toying with for a while, a Saturday matinee James Bond. He told Spielberg he had an entire trilogy planned for his old-fashioned hero, and they shook hands on the spot. That character turned out to be Indiana Jones, and George Lucas turned out to be a liar. Lucas only had loose concepts for adventures beyond Raiders of the Lost Ark, and certainly no plans for a connected trilogy. When success all but demanded a sequel, Lucas pitched two very different, very persistent ideas. A story about the Chinese legend of the Monkey King, and another set entirely in a haunted castle. Spielberg vetoed both. He thought the Monkey King idea was too far-fetched, and he'd had his fill of ghosts producing 1982's Poltergeist. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom opened in the summer of 1984 to an eager, confused public. It was darker, grosser, and altogether less family-friendly than its predecessor. It had its fans, and more over time, but plenty of critics and baffled parents considered it an ugly insult to taste. Many compared it unfavorably to another 1984 adventure movie, Romancing the Stone. Despite being written before Raiders, everybody and their extended families called it a ripoff, but that still counted as a compliment considering the gloom of Doom. Regardless of the reception, Indiana Jones' second adventure became the third highest grossing movie of 1984. But the real damage, the damage behind the scenes, was already done. Spielberg was hurt. Backlash over the film's juvenile gags and careless depiction of Indian culture took on a personal sting. He needed to step away from the big-budget B-movies to prove his maturity as a filmmaker. But that didn't stop George Lucas from working his old sequel ideas with a writer who almost made too much sense. Diane Thomas was waiting tables in a roadside diner when she sold her script, Romancing the Stone, to Michael Douglas for $250,000. It was the eighth-highest-grossing movie of 1984 on a third of Temple of Doom's budget. The press deemed her a screenwriting Cinderella, and Lucas took note. Thomas's script followed Indiana Jones on a universal horror-style adventure into a sprawling haunted castle as per Lucas's long-simmering concept. Unfortunately, she only finished the first draft before her untimely death in 1985. Not long after, Spielberg passed with the poltergeist defense for a second time, but George Lucas wouldn't abandon his Indiana Van Helsing idea that easily, so he found another writer from a familiar neighborhood. Chris Columbus, fresh off of Gremlins, the fourth highest grossing movie of 1984, took Lucas's other direction and turned out several drafts for Indiana Jones and the Monkey King. At least one of these drafts, with the alternate title Indiana Jones and the Garden of Life, has since found its way online and provides a startling reminder of how many franchise rules were only cemented by Last Crusade. Columbus's Monkey King includes, among other assorted strangeness, adorable pygmy sidekicks, steampunk Nazis with machine gun arms, and a scene where Indiana Jones outruns a three-story tall, 100-foot-long tank on the back of a rhino. 
The oddest part, however, might be the opening gambit, which manages to squeeze Lucas's entire haunted castle concept into about 10 pages. The year is 1937. Indiana Jones is on vacation in Scotland and struggling to catch trout when torch-wielding villagers interrupt him. They're crippled with fear over the latest in a series of grisly murders. Jones, along with Inspector Scotsman McStereotype, are enlisted to solve the case once and for all. The villagers can barely even offer ambiguous warnings about the killer not being human before a mysterious light draws the heroes to an ancient haunted castle. From there becomes Indiana Jones and the House of Dracula. Jones follows disembodied laughter down the castle's labyrinth halls through ornate bedrooms covered in cobwebs and macabre detail. The local police get picked off one by one, disappearing in a split second of darkness. Eventually, after falling through a subterranean crypt and fighting hellhounds, Indiana Jones confronts the allegedly immortal master of the house, Baron Seagrave, only for a pair of seven-foot-tall suits of armors to animate and attack. After he drops a chandelier on them, Jones holds up a sword to Seagrave's cackling throat until the authorities arrive. Then the script casually confirms the existence of non-divine ghosts in the Indiana Jones universe. Indiana Jones and the Monkey King didn't pass Steven Spielberg's muster either. He found it too far-fetched for an indie adventure, and it's easy to see why. Not long after, Lucas would dig up another old sequel conceit, which Spielberg once dismissed as too spiritual, but this time he'd change his mind on the Holy Grail. So, this story was a little long, but I found it fascinating, and I hope you did too. I will leave a link to the article of this story from bloodydisgusting.com on the I Like It Spooky Horror Podcast Facebook page, so if you are interested, you can read through portions of the actual 10-page screenplay as well. And that's a wrap on this Monday edition of Spill the Guts. Don't forget, you can find the I Like It Spooky Horror Podcast on virtually every social media outlet. Check our Facebook page for a link to the last story and drop a comment if you think a horror Indiana Jones flick would have been a cool thing to see. But perhaps most importantly, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss a feature episode like what hit the air yesterday where we interviewed Justin Beam of Reverend Entertainment or a Spill the Guts news blitz every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Which returns with more news this coming Wednesday on another edition of Spill the Guts. Hey, what's wrong with you, man? Show some fucking respect for the dead, will ya?